Well, thank you very much, uh, Mitch, and thanks, uh, Dennis, for inviting me again. And uh, you know, there's a lot of good memories uh, for me here. Not only the, the uh, previous Beto lecture, but I've been here uh, before that on a number of occasions. A lot of uh, colleagues, these are kind of my people here in the life and crime that we're all going through. So it's a really a pleasure uh, to be back, uh, to be back here. Um, what I uh, have been, been working on a book uh, slowly uh, on the subject of uh, criminal records and what I think of as the jurisprudence and uh, policy issues that are generated by uh, the topic of criminal records, teaching a seminar on that subject uh, for the last uh, couple of years and like many uh, topics that one goes into in our field and maybe maybe in any field as an academic, uh, uh, it gets uh, deeper and more complex the more you get into it. And so my, my goal today is, is kind of a, of a modest one, is just to, con to convince you uh, that this is an important uh, topic for criminal justice uh, uh, specialists and scholars and one worthy of serious attention and to highlight for you some interesting uh, core issues that are, that are uh, surround the subject of criminal records, and then to invite and uh, stimulate discussion uh, of what, what pieces of this uh, you find uh, interesting. So uh, the criminal justice system, when you, when you stop to think about it, it's all about making uh, criminal records, right? The, as Justice uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg recently wrote in Herring versus the United States, uh, a case that, that uh, arose in Texas, uh, she said uh, electronic databases form the nervous system of contemporary criminal justice operations. And I like that metaphor very much, uh, the nervous system. Indeed, criminal justice agencies thrive on records, both as producers and consumers. And if you stop to think about it, uh, all the records that, that are, are, are created and passed around and stored in, uh, in the criminal justice system, it's really quite impressive. Uh, for example, uh, police complaints, uh, court dockets, uh, indictments and informations, pretrial motions and briefs, trial transcripts, pre-sentence reports, uh, probation files, right? prison files, parole files. Right? This is a massive amount of information which is increasingly uh, uh, in the, in the uh, IT age is being um, stored and which is being passed around and is much easier to re retrieve. So although there are many different types of criminal records, uh, the individual criminal history record or the rap sheet, the record of arrest and prosecution uh, is the most uh, ubiquitous. And often when we talk about your criminal record, what, we, uh, what people mean is your rap sheet, right? Is a record of arrests and prosecutions and uh, it should be a chronological record of everything that happens from arrest uh, uh, and, and subsequently in a particular case. And uh, for a particular individual, once they have a rap sheet, as you probably know, then all their, all their subsequent contacts with the criminal justice system, all subsequent arrests are collected on that, uh, on that rap sheet. Um, in effect, the rap sheet has become a kind of negative curriculum vitae. And so I ask you to think about, the, about how much attention we pay to our creation of our CVs. Uh, which are a, a compendium of our accomplishments. And we put nothing disreputable on our CVs. We, we create ourselves in our CVs. They are our, 
are self-created biographies or autobiographies, right? A, a, uh, a document of accomplishments, we go right up to the level of uh, distortion and maybe even past that level in trying to present a positive picture of ourselves. And then uh, the mirror image of that is uh, the government's uh, creation of a CV for people who have had contact with the criminal justice system. And that CV is exactly the opposite. It is only a compendium of disreputable uh, activities and, and conduct. Uh, it has nothing positive on it. It is only a record of, of, uh, of uh, failure and uh, antisocial uh, anti conduct. Uh, so a large percentage of the population goes through uh, life bearing this negative curriculum vitae, right, which comes to mark their character and to be predictive of their future uh, conduct, right, and, uh, and uh, a, uh, a large percentage of the population, a larger percentage, goes through with a curriculum vitae that they, that they make out and they hand around and that purports to mark their, their positive uh, uh, character. This, uh, this uh, criminal record uh, has uh, stigmatizing, labeling, and identity uh, creating significance of, of enormous uh, consequence. It has uh, negative, important negative consequences for future interaction with the police uh, with prosecutors and courts. So um, just, just, to, just to refresh you on that, once you have a criminal record, it's much more likely uh, that you would be investigated by the police. Uh, and once you're investigated by the police, the fact that you have a criminal record makes it more likely that you would be taken into custody by the police rather than released makes it more likely that the prosecutors would charge you rather than dismiss your, uh, dismiss your case uh, right out, makes it uh, 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 more likely that you would, the courts would decide to hold you in pretrial detention because criminal record is one of the determinants uh, that courts use in determining whether someone should be held in pretrial confinement or, and, or, or have a bail imposed or simply released on their own recognizance. It's important for, uh, for uh, plea bargaining. And in fact, I, I think a prosecutor's office is uh, often what they're trying to do is, is create records on people, especially on low-level crimes. See the records, uh, the number of arrests and prosecutions mounting up until a clear picture emerges of a particular individual. And, some, and then uh, each, at each stage, the, uh, the charging is more severe. The, the requested uh, sentence is more severe. And what, what is often going on uh, in, a, uh, in, in a high volume criminal justice system is the stamping of that negative curriculum vitae. And it's the record in most cases which is the most severe consequence uh, that is imposed or inflicted onto a criminal defendant, right? In most cases, there is no, there is going to be no punishment, no jail time, no prison time, right? No, not even probation, but it'd just be the, the record, right? And the, then the consequences of that record. Uh, your criminal record, uh, as, as you know, has a lot of consequences at, uh, at sentencing, right? Uh, and in fact, we have a whole jurisprudence uh, built around recidivism, right? The best example being the three strikes law, right? If you have two previous felonies, let's say in California with the best known three strikes law, well, but if your current uh, crime is an auto theft or a grand larceny, Maybe the, the punishment would be a maximum year or, or a couple of years imprisonment. But if you have 
a, a significant uh, negative curriculum vitae, the maximum of punishment is life, uh, is life imprisonment under the three strikes, uh, under the three strikes law. Um, and uh, there you know, many, many, many examples of, uh, of recidivist uh, jurisprudence, right? We're sentencing people in many cases more on, on their record, right, than we are on their current, uh, their current uh, uh, crime. Um, it even, uh, uh, criminal records even important in, uh, in prison, uh, uh, classification and can be important uh, at the uh, at the parole stage uh, as well, and so I urge you to kind of think about how these records are created and embellished and passed around and used and disseminated uh, up and down the line in the criminal justice system. But the criminal record also has uh, negative consequences. Uh, uh, for governmental benefits, um, student loans can be uh, denied on the basis of a criminal record. Uh, people are made ineligible for public housing based upon their criminal record and also ineligible for other uh, welfare uh, benefits. Um, and then there are the, de those are what, what I would call the de jure uh, consequences of a criminal record by law. You are ineligible uh, for certain opportunities and benefits to certain occupations uh, because of a criminal record, but there are also de facto consequences of, of having a criminal record, um, especially in the employment area. And so surveys of employers uh, reveal that a very high percentage, the majority of employers, would not hire someone with a criminal record, especially in a period of time uh, where, where uh, uh, employers are, are limited in the number of people they're hiring. So they're not desperate to make hires. Then those with criminal records are going to be excluded, come last uh, in the line. And so the implications for many people uh, of, of having a conviction on their record going to be greater in terms of these de facto discriminations than they would be in terms of the formal sentence which is meted out uh, by the criminal justice system. And um, these, uh, the criminal record is becoming uh, more and more uh, ubiquitous. Uh, in, uh, in, in American society, there was an interesting national task force on the criminal backgrounding of America uh, that came out with a report a couple of years ago on, on how, um, how, how, how much proliferation there has been in the use of, of getting criminal records in all sectors of, of, uh, of, of social and economic life uh, in the country. 9-11 um, alone generated millions of annual new, uh, new background checks as Congress imposed uh, uh, restrictions on, on uh, who could work in uh, the hazardous material industries and in the ports and so forth. You had to have a criminal background to check. And then if you had certain criminal backgrounds, you couldn't uh, work there. Congress also authorized a great amount of background checking and so that the FBI would be, uh, record system would be available for whole industries uh, and, and voluntary associations that, that um, work with children, for example, um, people would be checked and their uh, criminal record uh, uh, negative curriculum vitae uh, would, be, would be either decisive or very important in whether they would be uh, allowed to work even as volunteers in a particular sector. Um, increasingly, the criminal record is is being consciously uh, wielded as a tool of social control. 
Uh, you're probably familiar with, uh, with uh, Megan's Laws, uh, for example, which is, it, which is the most aggressive, an example of the most aggressive use of criminal records, which laws that mandate that a criminal record be disseminated clearly and, and directly to the community so that the community should know that a particular person has a criminal record and then fill in the dots and act accordingly towards that person or take what defensive measures are necessary to protect yourself against that person. Uh, there are, and there's also a movement of shaming sanctions um, which, which uh, uh, require a, a people to advertise or which advertise for them their their criminal record right? in order to shame them with the community, in order to achieve greater deterrence, in order to uh, reinforce uh, uh, techniques of, of, uh, of avoidance of victimization. So the IT revolution has made the criminal record system much, much more efficient. Uh, but that very efficiency uh, carries serious societal costs, which I will discuss in a moment. Uh, but just on the efficiency point, the recording, the retrieving, and disseminating of criminal records is booming. Um, perhaps uh, supply has been spurred by demand. Um, everybody wants more information, right? But demand has also been fueled by supply, right? So just the very fact that, that these records exist and that they are retrievable has generated demand for them in sectors where there previously wasn't demand. And in fact, in, in a private sector information industry has arisen, right, which is in the business of selling such information to employers and uh, to, uh, to landlords and to uh, organizations and even to private individuals. And this industry has every reason to try to persuade people that they need this information. And if you uh, were to go on the internet and uh, Google in criminal records and you'll find uh, 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 a huge number of uh, companies advertising that they will uh, supply you with information about any person's criminal record. Either they'll claim that in, in your state or nationwide and for a very modest uh, fee, you can find out about uh, uh, someone uh, uh, who you might be considering admitting to your school or uh, taking on as a tenant in your, in your apartment building or in your house or even a love interest. You can check them out uh, through these, uh, all of these companies. The companies argue that, uh, that this is, uh, uh, you know, just makes sense as a strategy of social protection and also for, for companies that it will protect you against negligent hiring lawsuits. And so they, they claim uh, with some degree of truth, but not total truth, that employers are at risk uh, if they don't look at the prior criminal record uh, CV of a prospective employee, that if that employee then harms uh, a, a customer or fellow employee, they'll be sued for negligently failing to um, have uh, scrutinized that person and excluded them from employment uh, uh, up front. And so this all fuels the demand, plus of course the demand from police, prosecutors, courts, probations, prisons, parole, to inform their decisions and make so that they can make better decisions at every stage of the process. Access to criminal records has never been easier. Um, the uh, uh, Congress has mandated, as I said, a great deal of background checking um, on behalf of private employers. It has authorized even more than it has mandated. Uh, states also have uh, legislation uh, which 
which authorizes uh, various categories of private employers to obtain criminal record information, say in the private security area, uh, in, uh, in, in just a, a whole range of areas uh, in which there's blanket permission uh, for employers to obtain uh, criminal records from the state criminal record repository. Um, state courts sell criminal records, uh, sometimes in bulk, right, so to private information vendors, and these vendors build their own, um, their own uh, uh, private uh, databases. This is a good example, by the way, of privatization of the criminal justice system. Uh, there was a time when criminal records were purely a public sector governmental function, but that is no longer the, the case. Uh, criminal records are now, uh, are now uh, collected and held and disseminated by private companies uh, as well. Uh, the FBI system carries out as many background checks for non-criminal purposes as for criminal purposes. In addition, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the National Instant uh, Background Check System for gun purchases, entire system of checking on people's uh, criminal record backgrounds in the, uh, in, in the area of, uh, of the purchasing and sale of firearms. Um, some states post uh, rap sheets online, uh, which can be accessed for uh, without a fee, others charge a fee. In, in my uh, home state of, uh, of New York, you can, have, uh, you can obtain anybody's criminal record, uh, not online, but by, uh, by uh, sending in a request to the, uh, to the state uh, court uh, system, and you'll get back uh, um, the, the, uh, the uh, targeted person's uh, rap sheet. Several states have prisoners indexes so that all the people who are imprisoned in the state are on an online uh, database and you can plug right into the database. Uh, all the states have Megan's Laws, uh, which require the registration on the one hand of sex offenders and on the other hand the dissemination of criminal records uh, of some of those offenders, the high risk ones, to various uh, groups within the community. There is also a national, uh, federal uh, sex offender database. There has uh, been a, a movement towards passing uh, e-government acts, e-government, electronic government acts. Uh, there's a federal uh, act and one in, in, many, uh, in many states with the idea of putting governmental activities uh, and, and uh, decisions online. And so it's possible now uh, to obtain, for example, all federal indictments are online and can be accessed and all the information in those indictments and indeed not just in the indictments, but in the whole criminal record file can be accessed from your home computer. And so the first uh, uh, dilemma, um, more the positive, there are, there are tremendous positive consequences, right, of this, of this growth in the efficiency, in this improvement in the efficiency of the criminal record uh, information system, uh, more information is better than less information. C it, assuming the criminal record is probative of character and predictive of future behavior, uh, people who have that information ma can make better decisions. People don't have to choose their employees, their students, their business partners, their friends, or their romantic interests in the dark, right? They can uh, choose them uh, uh, with better information. On the other hand, there are social costs to this proliferation of criminal records and of access to criminal records. The easier 
that criminal records are to retrieve, um, the harder it is uh, for the, uh, the uh, labeled person to escape his or her past, and the harder it is for people who have been convicted of crimes to escape their past, and the more that their opportunities are limited, uh, the more the uh, the more they will they will they will be channeled into a criminal underclass, and uh, the more intractable will become the this uh, 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 this criminal underclass, and and uh, putting fairness uh, considerations to the side, whether that's fair for people or not, but putting that to the side, that cannot be good for uh, for a society. I mean, we don't want to have an intractable uh, uh, criminal class in which the members of that class only see their future in terms of their participation in the criminal uh, underworld, right, and in crime. I mean, that is enormously costly for the society. It, 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 it's a, enormously destructive for the society. So here, my, my uh, interest in criminal record uh, uh, dovetails uh, very nicely with uh, the work on the reentry uh, re -entry movement. And those of you familiar with that will, will immediately see the connection, right? And that criminal records is a, is a kind of subset part of the re, of the re -entry problem. Although on the other hand, it's even broader than these, both narrower and broader than the reentry, uh, the reentry problem, and so uh, what, what then, what then um, uh, arises for me is well, what could what could be done about this? I mean, what what kind of what kind of conscious policies are optimal on collecting and uh, and uh, making criminal records available and disseminating criminal records. I mean, where do we stand on this? Do we want to eventually move happily towards having all information about people's criminal records available online, costless? I mean, is that a desirable goal for us? And it's certainly achievable in the very near future, or do we want to restrict the availability of uh, criminal records, uh, or at least some criminal records, to at least some people who might want criminal records? So what, what kind of a stand should we take on this? And I, I think here there's not a great deal of, uh, of writing and not a great deal of, uh, of scholarship on this topic, and so that's, I'm hoping to make some kind of contribution here. First, I, 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 the way I approach this, I want to ask, well, what, what could be, if we wanted to restrict the amount of, 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 uh, of, of access to criminal records, then, then what could we do about it? Well, one is we could create fewer criminal records. We could have a conscious policy of, of having fewer so how could we do that? Well, we could decriminalize in certain areas. So if some conduct wasn't a crime, we wouldn't have a criminal record. We could, we could consciously uh, 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 have policies that the police would not arrest or at least would not book, you know, and thereby, thereby start the rap sheet process going as many people as they do now and have certain uh, restrictions. On, uh, on that, uh, but of course there are also uh, costs. We don't want to decriminalize uh, uh, necessarily uh, uh, certain kinds of conduct and, uh, and the police have reasons to book people. First of all, uh, the, the easiest one is we want to know who this person is, right? In a society without um, a national identity uh, card and so forth. You arrest a person, they say they, they are Dennis Longmire. We don't know who, who this person actually is until they're fingerprinted, until we check out they're fingerprinted, we find out that it's not Longmire, it's actually John Doe, public enemy number one, right? We happened to cross him. So, you know, there are important reasons to, to book people and to, uh, to uh, record um, 
those, uh, those interactions. It, it also helps us to keep control over the police, to know what police are doing. Uh, we could make criminal records uh, maybe less accessible uh, to the public and to subsections of the public, but that is not easy given where we are now uh, because we have three systems of access to criminal records in the United States. We have the, we have the executive branch uh, uh, system in, in the, uh, uh, the police rap sheets that are held by the criminal record repositories in each state. So you've got that system. That's the easiest one to control, right? You have the court records, which is, is uh, very difficult to figure out what to do with. The courts in the United States have always been open, right? And court records by tradition and to some extent uh, by the Constitution have always been open so that you could go into a courthouse, you could ask to see a file or any files, you can copy the files, you can take notes on the files, right? That has been part of, of our commitment to a transparent criminal justice system. Could, could we or should we in some way cut back on that? It would be very difficult even if it were constitutional. And thirdly, we, we have the, uh, the now in place a very uh, significant uh, uh, private sector of, of commercial information vendors that have large databases of their own, which they have obtained mostly from courts and from court records, right? And they are a third system. Uh, maybe we could outlaw the whole business of, of private sector information vending, I mean, that would be, uh, you know, a very big pill to swallow. Not even clear to me whether that would be constitutional. Could we say you cannot, you cannot give out information about somebody's cr criminal history, even when that criminal history is a public event? I have grave doubts about that. We could uh, prohibit uh, discrimination based upon criminal record. Uh, for example, we could erase uh, de jure disqualifications, like the ones I was talking about for student loans or for public housing. Um, but, but, and, and I think the reentry movement has put a lot, of, uh, a lot of focus on that. The American Bar Association put a lot of focus on that. And, urging that there be no blanket uh, uh, disqualifications based upon criminal record, and that might be a good idea. Uh, but each of these disqualifications um, has, uh, you know, has a rationale behind it. Um, each one seeks to deter the kind of conduct that leads to the disqualification. Plus, each one wants to uh, preserve the integrity of the of the system from which they're trying to exclude people with bad character. Um, we could add criminal record to the list of, of uh, categories uh, of, uh, on which one uh, uh, cannot discriminate. So we could say uh, from now on, no discrimination based upon race, religion, gender, or criminal record, um, you know, that would be a, a tremendous uh, change and, and uh, we, we, could, we could have a, a long conversation about that. Uh, those other categories, uh, there's no rational basis and no moral basis for discriminating in employment or housing on the basis of race, religion, or gender, but criminal record is different, right? There is a rational reason to discriminate on the basis of criminal record uh, to the extent that criminal record is probative or predictive of future conduct, which it appears uh, to be. Uh, so would it be fair and, and, and appropriate to uh, tell people that they could not 
engage in such discrimination? And uh, would it be enforceable uh, in, any, uh, in any event? Um, how, could we, uh, uh, how could you enforce that? It would be very, very difficult uh, to enforce. I mean, one way might be that you, you wouldn't allow employers to get criminal records. Uh, could we actually do that? Could we make it a crime to violate that prohibition and get criminal records? Could we impose civil liability? Um, tough questions. Maybe we could, we could, a really interesting answer would be we could change the meaning of criminal record. I mean, all this problem would go away if people thought that criminal record had no significance in terms of a person's character and future conduct. Think, for example, of, of you were about to hire somebody or admit somebody to school, and uh, is anything you want to tell me and say, yes, I had an overtime parking ticket uh, last week, and I had a speeding ticket last year. I think people would say, well, that, that's completely irrelevant. I mean, that doesn't have any reflection on your character. Uh, it would be of no interest uh, to us. And maybe uh, people could be convinced that uh, various kinds of criminal records uh, likewise uh, have, no predictive, uh, have no predictive capacity. Or maybe we could end up doing such a good job in processing people through the criminal justice system on probation and prison that the fact that a person had been convicted and sentenced and been on a probation and gone through probation program or even a prison program would fortify our confidence uh, that they would not commit a crime in the future. That not only was it not predictive of future criminality, it was predictive of future desistance from crime given the, given the success of those programs. Uh, I mean, that would be, that would be highly desirable. Uh, you know, that would be a win-win situation, but we are very far, right, from making that into a reality. We could provide tax incentives for employers who hire uh, people with criminal records, and uh, believe it or not, we tried that in the late 1960s and early 1970s with a program called the targeted uh, uh, jobs uh, uh, tax uh, credit something or other incentive and uh, that was found not to have been uh, successful it turned out that employers only hired the people they were going to employ anyway uh, and that it did not lead to uh, additional employment we could try to help a convicted the con convicted persons build a positive cv right that they could that they could present along with the negative CV. Uh, this is an idea that I have floated uh, elsewhere, so we could have some governmental uh, kinds of work programs. Uh, maybe we could even do this in, in prison situations whereby a person uh, would, would obtain uh, good references, right, and start working on a, creating a, a, a positive curriculum vitae Right? With, the, with the conscious assistance of the government so that people would have references from people and from programs. But such programs would obviously have to be credible. Right? They would not just be able to give references to everybody, if they, and, and if they gave references to everybody, right, then it would be useless. They would have to be rigorous, be very, very rigorous, so that, so that they were really a stamp of approval Right, of people who had been extremely successful in going through the programs, and that would lead you to how expensive would that be, how many people would actually get those references, and what would happen to the people uh, who didn't get uh, the references. We could have government uh, employment programs, uh, which the reentry people have, uh, have talked about. Uh, that's difficult in a high unemployment environment like we have now to say that uh, we will assure employment to people who've been convicted of crime but not to those who have not 
yet been convicted of crime. I mean, what kind of an incentive is that? Uh, so none of these are, are, uh, are uh, great uh, solutions. Uh, there may be some promise uh, in some of them, and they all need to be thoroughly considered. At least we should ensure that criminal records are accurate and, uh, and comprehensible. Uh, and this would open up a whole nother window on the criminal records uh, issue, is that to some extent criminal records are not accurate at the present time. There's a lot of inaccuracies in there. Uh, uh, people have records of things they didn't do. There are mistakes in the system. Cases have been dismissed and those aren't noted, so we don't do, do as well as we should do in getting dispositions into the criminal record system. And then there's the question of comprehensibility, right? I, uh, as I, I uh, let's say I'm an employer or I'm uh, on the admissions committee of a university and somebody shows me their criminal record and they were convicted of some Texas statute section such and such, such and such as many rap sheets will show. I don't know what that is and I'm not interested in taking the time to look it up. And even if I looked it up, our criminal laws are written in broad categories, so if we find that the person was convicted of, of, of a assault and battery, I don't know what that was. Was that a domestic disturbance? Was it a, a, was it a fight at a frat house? Was it a, was it a, you know, a, 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 a stranger on stranger fight on the streets? I mean, it could be anything. And how do I find out what it is? That leads me to wonder whether our criminal record system shouldn't have more information on it rather than less information. Right now it's very, very abbreviated and we're left to imagine what might have happened. Right? Also, plea bar our plea bargaining system uh, uh, throws more uh, uh, obfuscation on criminal records. The person was arrested for rape. Uh, they were convicted of assault. Should I think of them as a rapist? Probably a rapist I, because of the plea bargaining system and they plead down to assault, but maybe there wasn't a rape and it was quickly determined that there was no rape and that this was uh, some, some uh, much lower level assault situation. I don't know, right, without doing some investigation and even then, how am I going to investigate this? Okay, I just I want to go on to a second uh, a second set uh, of dilemmas on uh, on the question of what counts as a criminal record. So I've been talking so far uh, as if criminal records were uh, records of conviction for a crime, uh, but I want to turn a spotlight on arrests rather than convictions, right? Does your, is your a criminal record, is a criminal record include arrests even if those arrests didn't lead to a conviction? How do we treat arrests? What do we do with arrest information? We could say, oh well, arrest information, that's a criminal record, right? You have a record of arrests. Um, on the first blush of, 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 of looking at this, it seems absurd that a single police officer, right, acting on his or her own for reasons which might be uh, uh, disreputable even, or maybe mistaken, could saddle a person with a, with a negative curriculum vitae for the rest of their lives. You say, well, that, that, that can't be right. And yet, uh, it turns out that that is pretty much uh, the situation which we currently have. And it turns out that arrests have almost as great a negative impact on job prospects as convictions. And there are several studies that have, that have uh, shown that when employers are, are confronted with a person's uh, uh, history and it shows that they've been arrested for a crime, even if the, it, the arrest was uh, dismissed, and even if it was led to an acquittal, it has as almost as much negative consequences in terms of the hiring decision as a conviction. 
um, an arrest record can have major implications uh, even for future criminal justice interactions, right? The fact that, you've, that you have a, a record of a single arrest or multiple arrests will have an effect on police uh, handling of, of, uh, of an interaction with you in the future and how the courts regard your case, how prosecutors regard the case. So for the people within the criminal justice system, an arrest has, has very significant consequences, almost as significant as a conviction. Um, the courts uh, uh, can use arrests to enhance sentences, right? and uh, uh, that's always been a part of our, of our jurisprudence. Even acquittals, even acquitted, even, a, even an arrest which led to an acquittal can, at least constitutionally, according to the Supreme Court, be used to uh, enhance a sentence, can be taken into account. Uh, by, uh, by a sentencing judge. So there are a lot of policy issues that that, uh, um, that, that generates. Uh, should arrests be kept somehow, be kept confidential? Okay, um, that, you know, you, your first reaction might be, well, you know, an arrest should be confidential unless it leads to a conviction, but not so fast. Do we really want secret arrests? I mean, the idea that arrests are public, that we know who has been arrested and for what, it tells us a lot about how the police are behaving. If we didn't have that information, we wouldn't have a whole uh, window of, of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, on, uh, on police uh, on, on police policy and on uh, discriminatory stops and discriminatory arrests and so forth, that would be we would we might be in a system of secret arrests, right? The system would be very different from what it is now. It would be a, a quasi secret system only known to those who are running the system. Uh, and that wouldn't necessarily be a very happy uh, solution. Well, if arrests uh, don't result in a conviction, maybe they should be erased from the, uh, from the record. Well, maybe they, maybe they should, and that should be taken seriously, but then the question is when would they be erased, right? It takes a while for a case to be processed. It could take, certainly take months and maybe a year maybe even more than a year for a case to be processed. During that time, there has to be a record of the arrest, right? So, so it can be coherently processed so we can know that if the person's a fugitive that they, and that they are then stopped somewhere, that they are facing a, a criminal prosecution, that they've been on trial and so forth. Uh, and during that period of time when the arrest is pending, right, pending an outcome, uh, it is public information Right? Uh, police blotters at the station house have always been public. Uh, court dockets have always been public. So it, the, the information could be obtained by private information vendors put into their, um, into their databases and then would effectively be public. Right? So it's not obvious how we, would, we could go about uh, uh, blocking access uh, uh, to, uh, to arrests. We'd also want to stop and make you think about, well, why, why wasn't this, didn't this arrest uh, um, ripen into a conviction, right? On uh, uh, first impulse, you might think, well, if a person's arrested and doesn't get convicted, he must be factually innocent and Certainly, we should draw no negative inference about the person's conduct. But we know that in a large percentage of cases where people who are arrested and they are not, uh, and they're not eventually convicted, it's not because they're factually innocent. Uh, the biggest reason is because victims uh, fail to follow through, and the victim might fail to follow through because she was intimidated, right? or she was reconciled you know, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, perpetrator, or maybe, maybe uh, relevant evidence was suppressed because it was wrongfully seized 
or maybe the prosecution took too much time and lost the case for speedy trial uh, reasons, or maybe the prosecution decided to give the, the person another chance and uh, to withhold the prosecution uh, uh, while the, the person was on a kind of prosecutorial uh, probation. But none of these reasons are, are um, uh, determinative of factual innocence, and the actors within the criminal justice system uh, don't treat them that way. They, they treat an arrest as probative of, of, uh, of guilt and of uh, a prediction of future criminality, right? Even if it doesn't ripen into a conviction. Indeed, even if the person is acquitted in, or, or maybe the case ends up in a hung jury at trial, right? Doesn't mean that the police and the prosecution and other actors in the system then regard the person as standing in the shoes of a completely innocent, uh, innocent person. So the reasons for us to hesitate uh, and, and to uh, question what we should do with arrest, with pure arrest information. Also, we need to think about what do we do with arrest information where the person pleads to a crime other than the one for which they were arrested. Should, should their record continue to reflect the larger crime for which they were arrested, or should that somehow be eliminated, right? It's stricken from history, and the only record left is that for which the crime for which they were convicted. Um, maybe access to arrest records could be limited to the police. Uh, I should say, and you might want to ask me about this in, in our Q&A, in Europe, I mean, it's a, they have a diametrically different kind of system where these records are limited to the police and where they separate out conviction records from arrest records, right? Their central repository of records is only a system of convictions, right? And they don't, their system wasn't built around police activity like ours is, right? And, uh, but, but our system is our system. Um, arrests, as I say, are public events in the United States. They become part of the court docket and uh, part of the rap sheet. Some states even post all pending cases online so they can easily be discovered by private information vendors. Nevertheless, a sealing of arrests might be a good idea, and in some states they do seal arrests which after a period of time have not ripened into a conviction. And so on the rap sheet it still says a person was arrested and then it says uh, sealed, right? Well, you still know the person was arrested, but you have no further information. You have to get a court order to get it unsealed, okay. We could prohibit discrimination based upon arrest record. Um, and uh, California, for example, prohibits employers from asking prospective employees about prior arrests. Query, you know, how effective that prohibition is or whether employers actually comply with the prohibition. The, um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission at the, the federal uh, level prohibits employment discrimination based upon arrest, right? So there, there we, we, we do see uh, employment policy uh, at work, uh, but it has not been vigorously enforced. And it also, the same directive, which prohibits employment discrimination based upon arrest, uh, says, but an employer can discriminate based upon the underlying conduct for which the job applicant was arrested if the employer has reason to believe that the applicant engaged in such behavior, right? So it can't, you can't discriminate just based upon the arrest, but you can discriminate based upon your reasonable belief that the conduct for which the person was arrested you know, actually took place. Well, how are you supposed to determine that? What, what would constitute reasonable belief? You might say, you know, this, you, you, could, you could see this as a, uh, 
in, in a circular way. You say, well, if, 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 if the police uh, say they have probable cause and a judge um, um, also uh, confirmed the existence of probable cause, that's my reasonable belief, right? If it was good enough for the police, it's good enough for me. What do you want me to do, hold a, hold a trial? It can't be that. You can't be asking the employer to hold a trial or the admissions committee at a university. Um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act allows credit reporting agencies, the ones that report your credit scores and so on, they also report uh, criminal record data uh, to people who are looking into your credit history. They, they can report arrest data for seven years. Um, or we could try to change the meaning of arrest. Uh, maybe it's not uh, publicly well understood uh, what inferences should be drawn from the fact that a person has been arrested for a crime. Uh, but that would force us to think deeply about what is the meaning of an arrest, right? And if we were to, to limit that meaning and what inferences could be drawn from an arrest, then maybe uh, prosecutors wouldn't drop as many cases as they do now, right? I mean, if you said they couldn't use the arrest information or that other people couldn't use the arrest information, maybe they would require more often that somebody plead to something rather than just dropping uh, the arrests. So, a whole range of questions about what we do about, uh, about arrest uh, uh, records. And finally, I just want to highlight a third dilemma, um, which is the creation of new types of non-criminal or quasi-criminal records. And here I've been most interested in gang databases. So we have the, uh, the creation of a, a whole new record type of record system like gang databases, immigration violator databases, terrorist databases, domestic violence restraining order databases. Uh, now, on, take the gang databases. Uh, uh, these, these have become very pervasive throughout the country uh, at, the, at the local level, the state level, the national level. They are more or less intelligence databases, and they do not require an arrest in order to enter somebody's name in the database. So if, if the uh, gang intelligence squad or, the, or who's ever in charge of, of looking at gangs in the city decides that uh, uh, Smith meets the criteria, that he has a tattoo or he was seen signaling to somebody with a known gang signal or was hanging out with known gang members or has been identified by a reliable informant as a gang member, can be inputted into the gang intelligence database, right? And then if the police are, uh, are, uh, want to know who is this guy, uh, they stop somebody, they get his name, they run his, uh, they run his uh, information, they find out he is a member of a gang or he's on the gang database and it's, uh, it's, it's linked to which gang he's a member of, um, they may well be almost certainly more likely to arrest the person. It is going to, the, the prosecutors will have this information. They're going to treat the person as a gang member. Uh, the judge is going to treat the person as a gang member. And so it's the very fact that you are in the database, even without an arrest, even without a probable cause determination by a magistrate, is a kind of criminal record. Now that kind of criminal record is not accessible to outside of the criminal justice system, at least not lawfully, right? But, and, and this is a point I haven't raised before, when, when so many tens of thousands of law enforcement personnel have access to the record system, the possibilities of leakage from that system are tremendous. And we, we know from all kinds of anecdotal reports that there's an old boy network in which retired police officers working as, as uh, private investigators or working for private information vendors have access to, uh, through their friends, to the databases and so forth. And it's not at all difficult to obtain that way, right, information 
about whether somebody is on one of these uh, one of these databases. Uh, and uh, the, the question of once we have the database, well, what are we going to do about the database, right? Well, how do you control that? We can't give people a hearing as to whether they're on the database or not, right? Are we, are we going to give them a lawyer and a hearing just because they're in an intelligence database? You've been identified as a person who's in the mafia, right? And you're in our, our mafia database. Here's a hearing. Well, we're going to tell you about our undercover agents and our electronic surveillance and so forth. And, you know, I mean, that cannot happen. So, you know, in, in the end, on the databases, the responsibility is, is solely uh, going to be on the uh, people within the criminal justice agencies, the decision makers, to, to set criteria and to scrutinize the databases and to decide how easy or hard it will be to input um, uh, identities into that database and how long they should be there, when they should be removed, how they should be removed, who should have access to them and so forth. Well, I think that that's about uh, enough to give you, uh, maybe giving you a headache already, but I mean, it's given you a, a, a flavor of what I'm doing and, and a sense of what I'm doing. And I hope I've convinced you that, that, that this isn't like a, a little arcane topic. I mean, this is a central topic for people who are interested in crime and justice in contemporary society. It has enormous uh, implications uh, uh, for offenders, for the criminal justice system, uh, for, for the way we go about the job of, of law enforcement and, uh, and adjudication, and for, uh, uh, and, and for the whole nature of our society itself. I don't think that there's a single overall solution to all these questions I've, I've asked you. I, I think we need to think about, uh, about uh, discreetly um, uh, 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 the whole range of questions and look for good policy uh, solutions at each, at each level, right? I mean, I think there are a lot of small policy decisions that have to be made. Uh, we need to think about what records we create. We've got to look at each type of record and the uh, content of, of what is kept in each of those records, how access should and can be regulated, how de facto and de jure discrimination based upon criminal records should be addressed, and how accuracy can be assured. Thank you. So if there are people in the audience who need to jump up and leave, this would be a good time to do it before we actually open the floor. Uh, I would also like those of you who are going to ask questions to shout the questions out as loud as you can so that the uh, mic can pick them up. And if you would, just give a short repeat as well. Thank you. And if we also place a burden on Dr. Jacobs to also try to repeat your questions. But, um, can't answer them. I can't yeah. repeat them. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. uh, with that said, uh, enough people have jumped up and left. Uh, raise your hands for questions. Yes, Professor. You've raised a number of questions. I wonder if you can answer a couple. Your best call possible in the world. Let's right. say you have an What records ought to be available and what ought not to be available for that individual in your best of all possible worlds? If I understand the question, it's uh, what, what kind of, uh, what, what, what ex access should there be to O.J. Simpson's criminal record? Or to someone not quite as famous, but with the same character. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I'm ready to, uh, to, uh, to commit myself to that. Uh, I, I think, obviously, 
it's obvious to me anyway, conviction records, we should be more uh, willing to give access to, crim to convictions and especially more willing to give broader access to convictions for serious crimes, uh, but maybe after a period of time, uh, that access should be uh, restricted. In Europe, in Europe, and I, I've been working with a Spanish colleague uh, in, in Spain, apparently, you can't get access to anybody's criminal record. I mean, nothing is available and nothing is public and nobody can have it. They view that it, that it would be violative of privacy and would also interfere with the, the right of rehabilitation. So they'd give out no information. Uh, I mean, I see this as a very, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry to hedge the question. I mean, I, 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 it would be hard for me to say that uh, people sh shouldn't know that a person that they are uh, uh, getting ready to deal with or go into business with has a history of fraud, right? It turns out to be Madoff, right? And he was just convicted of fraud and paroled somewhere. But no one, but you, you are restricted from from finding out about that. I mean, that that just seems ridiculous to me, right? On the other hand, right, it also is seems very disturbing to me uh, that we get a situation where a person who's been convicted of a crime of fraud, a crime of dishonesty, can never obtain another job anywhere. Right? and is really being told the place for you in the future is in the criminal underclass. That's where we see your future. Right? There has to be, I mean, from, from the standpoint of, uh, of the society, some way back. I don't know, what do you think? Well, I wonder what you mean by putting someone in a criminal underclass. Does it mean that that label determines all of their subsidies? Them into criminality or that it channels them away from some non-criminal okay. activities into others. Fair enough, but I mean we, we are quickly moving to the point where we, we have more laws which say that a person with a criminal background cannot work. They can't work in hazardous uh, uh, material industry, they can't work in the port, they can't work uh, um, in, um, in the airport, for example. So we, we, and a lot of that, is, or at least a good bit of it, is by legislation. And then if, if employers are going to be, uh, have access to all this information, uh, you know, they may draw their own inferences. And so, I mean, they're not going to order them to become criminals, but the, the consequence uh, uh, is going to is going to be that. That's the only place left uh, for you. I was talking to a, a lawyer in the Commerce Department uh, recently, and she said the Commerce Department has to hire 800,000 people to carry out the census, all right, coming up. Is it going to hire 800,000 people? I said, we're faced with the question of, you know, what kind of criminal records ought to be disqualifying for the census workers. So I said, well, what, you know, uh, what's your, uh, I mean, what, do, you, do you do criminal background checks? Said, we, we have to do criminal background checks uh, for everybody who applies. So we have all this information now on everybody's criminal record. How do we go about assessing what is a reasonable policy? She said, there are people in Congress just waiting for one of these census workers to enter somebody's home and assault the person or rape the person or, or loot the home and trash the home, right? Then the whole census, you know, is going to be undermined by Congress. And if not by Congress, then by the population at large. Once this becomes known that one person was attacked by a census taker, right, nobody will want to cooperate with the census again. So she said, well, maybe, uh, you know, uh, some of the staff think any, any kind of 
criminal record other than you know the most minor should be disqualifying in order to protect against that. And then you say, well, who are you going to get to do this work? I mean, these are limited jobs in the census. So we got we got a lot of unemployment in the country. So I mean, here's a way to bring people back into the world of work and into legitimate uh, into legitimate activity. In in a way, um, I, I'm I'm I'm. Uh, led to think about the expression uh, TMI, right? Too much information. Sometimes the younger people talk about too, don't give too much information. We have too much information, right? Once we have this information, then we're required to do something about it. Yes, sir. So that's very good from our, our, our colleague from Turkey. And it's, 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 it's so valuable, I think, to have people from different countries in our, in our classrooms. And uh, they add a lot to uh, my classes at NYU. So the comment was that uh, in, one, one important part of the comment was that in Europe, yes, it's different. But employers, or at least some employers, can obtain information by asking the person for a, a certificate of good citizenship, yeah. something like that. So you have to come from the police and uh, with, with a certificate that says you have no criminal record. Or from the court. Yeah, well, some countries from the police or from the court. Some, there's some, but in some countries, they don't even allow that. So there is a difference within the European, uh, within the European countries uh, about that. But, and I don't. I'm not an expert on the different procedures in Europe, but I, I am sure that there's much less access to criminal records in Europe and that employers are much less concerned with criminal records in Europe than they are in the United States. And I'm not sure why that would be, whether, I mean, it is one of these cultural traditions that maybe people are not as uh, worried about crime. Maybe they're not, a, they, it, it, it's not, it doesn't generate as much fear of crime. Or maybe they view people who have been uh, convicted still as part of the community and not as the other as much as we do in the United States. But I think this comparative look is very, uh, is very, very interesting. I mean, I am an outsider, you know, I am from another part of another country, and you know, when I think about, you know, the constitutional standards in America, you know, freedom, you know, democracy, but on the other hand, I just look at this issue, for example, we just, you know, keep the record, the record, and these records are used, I mean, 
for unemployment issues or I mean they just affect the future of people. I mean this really I mean we I know it, it, it I, and I'll bet you don't have any private companies that engage in selling criminal record information. No. Yes. So uh, I had a Canadian student who, who took my seminar on this and, and, and he was constantly amazed. He says, well, you know, here in Canada, we, we don't have this. We don't have any of these companies, right? I mean, why is it that the, the US, is, as far as I know, the only country that has an industry of selling criminal records? So that's, uh, that is very interesting, uh, very interesting. A lot of interesting stuff here. One point that you make is, is that in, in Turkey and in, in all the European countries, arrest records are kept uh, by the police and, and uh, conviction records are kept uh, in, a, in a really at a court kind of system uh, uh, at, at the national level in what's called a register, right? The criminal register. And these systems develop separately, right? One by the courts and one by the police. Our system, of, of our rap sheet system, was a police-based system, right? And it expanded and, and then became used by all of the agencies, right? So, so our criminal record system was built on an arrest system. Now, that might have just been historical happenstance. I mean, I'm not, I don't know that anyone ever thought that someday we would have a, a massive interconnected criminal record system uh, covering the whole country built on the police record and the booking record. Right? We could have done it a different way, but we didn't d do it a different way. Um, and I wonder whether it's now too late to try to split the system off and say the, the police will have, only the police will have records of arrests and we will purge the arrest from, what, from the records that are kept in the, in the, at, the, uh, at the level of the states and then in the level of the FBI. I mean, it would, it would require changing a lot of the ways we operate and maybe we're too far down the road but it has put us into an awkward, uh, an awkward position. Now, arrest, arrests are public in, in Europe, right? Although they're not as public as they are here, and newspapers are not allowed in some countries to publish uh, the names of people who are arrested. And even the people who are on trial, right? So it's, it, it, they have a different view of what is public and what is private and a much different view of, of the, the role of the community and the public in the criminal justice system. As in many things, I mean, we, our country is radically democratic, radically democratic in that in the, the, the people are very much involved in the operation of the criminal justice process in a way that is very foreign to Europeans, where it is left to the government itself and to the government experts to run the system, right? And it's everything from the jury trial to the way we handle criminal records. Are you going to call on people? Yeah. Uh, okay. Like Alexander Haig, right? <laughs> And so you think it will, it, 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 I mean, if, if it turned out that we, that we found out more and more disreputable information about the people who are running the criminal justice system or in positions of responsibility, it might undermine the legitimacy of the system. On the other hand, it might also change our view about 
the, the, the predictive uh, uh, power of a criminal conviction or an arrest. If we were to say, well, look, all these people have been arrested, right? Professor A, B, and C have been arrested. They, in fact, they were convicted as kids, but now they're reputable members of the community, so you shouldn't read too much into it, right? I don't think that that, you know, Okay, maybe you could say, just to uh, recapitulate that. I, I think what you said is right. The community plays a much bigger role in the criminal justice system here than it does in other countries. Uh, uh, let's just think about the grand jury, the jury system, right? The, the nature of public trials. And the fact that, that, it, the, 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 that, that we want people, maybe, maybe we want people to know about who was convicted of a crime for two reasons, and I think you've stated them correctly. One is it will deter people from committing a crime if they knew that this was going to be made public, right? If they knew the whole thing would be just a private operation, maybe, maybe people would, would, would be less you know, uh, uh, willing to, to desist from crime. And the second uh, uh, reason is we think maybe, maybe people in the community have a right to know in order to uh, take steps to, uh, to uh, regulate their interactions and protect themselves against people who might uh, aggress against them physically or against their property or so forth. So I think that for the, the, both of those reasons are are very much a part of our culture. Yeah, I guess I'm sorry, I should restate my question more succinctly. Um, if that's the case, uh, and that's the case, then how do we go about changing those perceptions? Because it seems like that's really the, the crux of the issue. If people want records for these reasons and they use them for these reasons, um, and we judge I mean, I mean, how would we convince people that this is too much information, right? Well, that this is too much information. I, I mean, is this all about a a public uh, education campaign and and to have an argument to persuade people? Like I just said, look, if if all of you are going to be hyper concerned about the records, about the negative curriculum vitae of job applicants, of, of, uh, of prospective business partners, of, of, uh, of uh, teachers, of people in the, Bo in the Boy Scout troop and so forth, we are going to end up hardening a criminal underclass. And that is going to create more crime and more problems for the society. So we ought to give people a, a, a blank slate. We ought not to want that information. We ought to trust that the police and the professionals will know how to take care of us and we should, uh, we should back off. That's not gonna be a popular, uh, that's not gonna be a popular position. So, so, so there's the dilemma. But it's not popular, that it, it, it doesn't seem to me to be a popular position that, that 
we label millions of people with this and, and we burden them with this heavy negative CV, right? And thereby severely restrict their options in the larger uh, community such that we end up, you know, generating the very problem that we're seeking to avoid. That can't be a good solution either. We do one thing that I know is going to sound fairly out of character. With long iron who denies the existence of time, it's 11 o'clock now, so we're already <laughs> about ready to spill over into the next segment. So I'm going to ask those of you who are doctoral students at least hold your questions until the next segment. Those of you who are not, Dr. Jacobs, email address is available online. Yeah. <laughs> send him an email present, uh, a good question. And I'm sure he will respond to in great detail. Thank you all very much. And thank you.